inside the 9-11 plot and why the FBI and CIA failed to stop it. As we approach an anniversary, which we all wish we do, did not have a need to commemorate, this book brings us inside the workings of our government and terrorist agencies. It is an attempt to explain why the events of what we refer to as 9-11 occurred. It is not a condemnation of individual officers or agents, but rather the story of why the isolation policies and jealousies of various government agencies failed to recognize that terrorism was bound to hit our shores. An Emmy Award-winning journalist, John Miller, reports for ABC. Formerly, he reported for NBC and he also served as Deputy Police Commissioner of the New York City Police Department for Public Affairs. Please welcome him. Well, thanks very much. Um, thank you very much for coming. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the book, The Cell, tonight. I'm going to try not to talk about it too much because um, I don't want to spoil the end for those of you who bought it. And um, I want to leave time for questions. So um, first, let me just um, give a, a few words about my background, um, which has a lot to do with how I got here and, and probably why I'm talking to you. My father was a reporter, and um, I ended up following him in, into this career, although not from the usual route. Um, he was a reporter for a venerable New York newspaper called the New York Inquirer. Um, <laughs> it later went on to be the National Inquirer. Some of you may be familiar with it. And um, he taught me the rules of journalism easy. It took me a great deal of time to unlearn them. <laughs> the way it worked was, when I was um, probably seven, eight, and nine, he decided that I was old enough to go with him on his rounds. Um, he wrote seven different columns under six different names. <laughs> One of them being John J. Miller. The other being John J. Rellum, which was Miller spelled backwards. Those were for the scandalous items he wasn't exactly sure about. Um, I think he was Sergio, someone from uh, Rome, and Pierre, someone from Paris, and Nigel, someone from London. And then there was his Hollywood identity, which I just can't remember. And um, his rounds consisted of going to the Copa, the El Morocco, the Rat Fink Club, the living room, all of the hot spots um, that the Rat Pack would have been at in New York. And my idea of a really cool Sunday night was catching the early show at the Copa, seeing Shecky Green and then Dean Martin. And maybe if we got really lucky, he'd turn on the police radio in the car on the way home and we could catch a homicide before bed. <laughs> this is what propelled me in a life, uh, towards a life of crime, or at least covering it. I got lucky. My father's friends from the Copa, of course, were all guys named Tony Two Arms and Angelo One Arm, and aside from the fact that their nicknames that I knew as their last names all stem from either food groups, body parts, or animals. <laughs> Harry the Dog, Louis Cheesecake. Um, they were a charming bunch who I later ended up um, covering and incurring the wrath of, only to find out guys in perp walks were saying, you don't remember me, I gave you a fire truck when you were six. So, it was an interesting development. The way, um, the way I came towards this business was, I got a job at Channel 5 News at night, going for coffee and bringing up tel uh, film from the lab. I still have to explain to my interns that, yes, there was a time when we actually shot on film and there was a lab because it had to be developed. But um, one day I called in in the middle of the night and they mixed me up on the telephone with somebody else and um, they put all the phones on hold and when they picked up the one that they thought was a guy named Andy Wilson, the veteran award-winning radio reporter, they explained that they had no reporters, that there was a big disaster in Queens and would I please respond to the scene and cover it for television. So, being in the ninth grade from New Jersey and it being, <laughs> it being a Sunday and a school night, I told my father that we really had to rush to the scene and um, and get this done in a hurry so I could get back home because I had homework. So I covered the story and brought the film back to the desk of the anchor man, Steve Bauman, who had been the guy answering the phones because they were very short-staffed on Sunday night. This was Channel 5 News. You guys know it as Fox. We knew it as Metro Media. It was the 10 o'clock news, and we didn't have the network budget. They say when the story called for a helicopter at Channel 5, we stood on a chair. <laughs> so getting back with... Um, the film, I put it on the anchorman's desk, and this was of no great consequence to him. He was used to seeing me bring up film. 
He said, where's the guy who covered this for television? It's our lead story. I said, that was me on the phone. You assigned me. He said, who the hell are you? I said, I'm in the ninth grade in New Jersey. I work after school, $2 an hour, three days a week. Anyway, on Monday, there was a small inquest to determine how it came to pass that a high school freshman covered the lead story on Sunday's 10 o'clock news. And um, they essentially said, if he could find his way to Bayside and back and bring the film in and have the interviews, then what the heck, when we run out of people, we can use him. So I got to work nights, which was crime. Now, 20 years later, I was minding my own business, sitting in Campagnola in Manhattan and uh, attempting to have a brajol. I don't know if you know what a brajol is. It's a little kind of tenderloin of pork rolled up, tied together with string, and it marinated in tomato sauce, herbs and spices, some pine nuts. It came with a little rigatoni, <laughs> some sausage, which I thought was overkill, and a couple of undersized meatballs. It's like a garnish. Um, so while I was planning for next day's Lipitor Fest and considering this meal, the beeper goes off, and they tell us, there's a cop shot, then they say there's a rabbi shot, then they say the incidents are connected, they're both at the Marriott Hotel. And everybody else at the table was assigned to Manhattan homicide. I had already been covering crime for 20 years at that point. Most reporters, of course, had started out in crime and then, like everybody else, moved up into the more important beats. I was a case of terrible arrested development. But getting to the scene that night, um, I found myself in the middle of the murder of a man I had just had lunch with um, a couple of months before, Rab Rabbi Meyer Kahana. And Rabbi Kahana had um, started the Jewish Defense League, which was a radical right-wing Jewish group that took direct action against um, groups and individuals that, that he thought were enemies. Um, and they had a string of bombings targeting the Russians for their oppression of Soviet Jewry. They had a string of bombings uh, targeting different um, Arab missions and businessmen. Um, they even blew up and caused a, a death, um, the office of Saul Hurok, who was a uh, concert promoter who promoted the Russian ballet. Um, so it was a very busy group that had been under the surveillance on and off of the FBI-NYPD Joint Terrorist Task Force, the JTTF, um, the group that is probably the driving force behind the detective story in this book, The Cell. And. Um, Kahani died shortly after being shot while making a speech um, at the Marriott Hotel at 49th and Lexington, was raced to Bellevue Hospital. Into the emergency room with him comes the gunman who was confronted by a police officer uh, for the postal service named Carlos Acosta, who um, dispatched him express mail right there on the street and when they engaged in a shootout while Nocer was trying to apparently carjack a taxi. Um, that night after leaving Bellevue, I went to New Jersey to Nocer's house and learned from detectives that when they got there, they had run into two men. And the two men were both taxi drivers. And the detectives quickly began to think, why would a well-planned assassination carried out by a guy end with him trying to hop a cab in Manhattan and make a getaway? So they began to think he probably jumped in the wrong cab. So they took these two guys in because they both admitted to having been around 49th and Lexington an hour before. And the next day, the chief of detectives said, can you tell us to the squad commander that this was the work of one man. And he said, can't tell you that. We're holding two other suspects. We found 16 box loads of papers in his house, including drawings of landmarks in New York City, diagrams of prominent places, Rockefeller Center, Times Square, um, the Statue of Liberty, the World Trade Center, and so on. And, um, and we also want to look at these two guys in their background a little further before we decide whether to make an arrest. And he said, that conspiracy stuff is for somebody else. We have a homicide. We have an arrest. We don't want to alarm the public. You shut up. They'll handle the conspiracy and release those two guys. Now, those two guys later went on to blow up the World Trade Center with a few other people. They also turned out to be his accomplices in the murder of um, Rabbi Kahani. But what happened that night was the beginning of two important things, maybe three. One. That night in Manhattan on November 5th, 1990, right here in New York City, the first Islamic terrorism cell was born and had gone to work 
Nocer and his friends had pulled their first job, taken their first direct action um, against the United States, or at least on the United States, against a target, which happened to be Rabbi Kahani, who might have been an Israeli target. He had been a member of the Knesset at one point. He was the leader of a political party there. The other thing that happened was the American law enforcement establishment on the ground level did its job. They caught the gunmen in a gun battle through terrific heroism. Chasing down leads, they found two possible accomplices. Doing thorough work and executing a search warrant, they found a trail of leads that would lead them on to a series of other plots. And of course, the third thread that started to stretch that night was the institutional bureaucratic pattern for denial. The idea that there were certain things that were just too messy, uh, things the government didn't seem to want to know, because that investigation, as much as it was starting to take off, was derailed and shut down. And I guess in the question and answer period, somebody's going to ask why, but we'll save that for the Q&A. <laughs> I'm always hard-pressed to come up with an answer for that one because it doesn't sound like it makes sense. Now, I worked in the police department for a little while and met all the parties involved, and I can probably explain to you the political thinking at the time. But to move forward with the story, what then happens is the Joint Terrorist Task Force guys get together and they say, well, if there is a conspiracy and it's going to be we who have to uncover it, then what do we have here? They were trailing a group of African-American um, Muslims in Brooklyn connected to some radical mosques who were suspected of robbing banks. But they weren't looking at that as terrorism per se. They were looking at that as a strictly criminal case. They were tearing... Uh, tailing a group of Egyptian men um, connected to the same mosque uh, who were doing all kinds of military training and target practice with long rifles at firing ranges. Strangely, in some of the surveillances, years later as they compared the photographs, they saw their two groups were coming together, um, cross-training sometimes, uh, meeting, exchanging uh, messages. The full import of that didn't come together for a while. What did come together is that both of these groups were acting with increasing violence or propensity towards violence. The one group um, had hired a man who luckily turned out to be an informant of the JTTF, and that group wanted commando training. They wanted to know how to scale walls and repel from buildings. They wanted to know how to do fast tactical stops of cars and pull people out very quickly. Uh, they wanted firearms training. And whatever it was that they were looking to do, and they didn't let on what their intended purpose was, it screamed violence to the task force. The other thing that was going on with the other group was that they um, were penetrated by a second informant, a man named Imad Salem. And he was reporting back to the FBI that they were talking about a series of bombings to carry on for Nocer, who was now in jail. Um, as a footnote, Nocer, who committed the Kani murder in, in front of a room as crowded as this one, and in front of this many witnesses, um, was acquitted of the murder and um, convicted of the gun charges and of shooting at the police officer um, in a very strange trial. But we'll get back to that. It's just another one of the things when you look back on this case and say, how did we get where we are today? Well, that's one of the reasons we got there. They were visiting Nocer in jail, and he had essentially two plots, the 12 Jewish locations plot, the bombing plot, and then a more self-serving plot, which was break me out of jail. Now, if you looked at the one group's training, repelling from walls, pulling people out of vehicles, um, doing fast-paced tactical assaults, that sounds like it could be a jailbreak to me. Call me paranoid. <laughs> um, the other group's intent was much more plain, which was to gather the materials, make devices, and select targets uh, that were connected to Jews in New York. The FBI hierarchy in New York did two strange things at this point. Number one, because the informant in the case where they were looking for the commando training uh, had begun to set up the meetings to give them the training and give them some of the equipment, although not weapons, some of the tactical equipment, Somebody in the FBI decided, we have to shut this down, it's too risky. Uh, what if two years from now, they use this training in some direct action here or somewhere else, and the newspapers find out, and the story is, FBI trained terrorist group. That's not going to look good. So they shut that down. The more remarkable thing 
in studies of risk-averse management decisions was that because Imad Salem, the informant who had penetrated the Nocer cell, which at that point was under the inspiration and leadership of the blind sheikh, uh, Omar Abdel Rahman, who was preaching at the mosque um, that these men frequented, they decided because that informant was afraid to wear a tape recorder. He knew the minute he put on a tape recorder, he'd, be, he'd have to testify in court that it was he who made the tapes, and he'd have to tell the rest of the story. He said, I'm willing to give you all the information every day about what these guys are up to, but I'm, I'm not going to lose my identity by this case because I'll never be able to work again as an informant or within the Arab community or anywhere else. So the FBI decided to fire him. Now they had effectively lost their eyes and ears into the commando plot and into the plot to set off 12 bombs in New York City. Now you have to wonder how it is that they could have cut off their eyes and ears into either plot, but particularly when targets who were already connected to a politically connected, uh, motivated murder were talking about blowing up 12 locations. How could they say, we only have one particular source of real-time information there and we're going to fire him now because he won't play by all of our rules. But they did. Um, I'm sure we'll get to that in the Q&A also. So, that being the case, the FBI tried to play the edges of it. The Joint Terrorist Task Force investigators were very frustrated. They wanted to go forward with both cases. Management said no. There were reasons for that, which I think I've covered some of, but still they were frustrated because they didn't know what was going to happen next. On, of course, February of 1993, they got their answer. There was a massive explosion in the World Trade Center. Six people were killed. Um, over a thousand were injured. There were billions of dollars in property damage and lost business. And now, far beyond the murder of Rabbi Kahana, um, terrorists had struck again, but in this way, a, in a way that resonated not just in New York City or even around the country, but around the world. Quickly, two things were done. Number one, Imad Salem, the informant who had penetrated that particular cell of people, was re-recruited, unfired, and put back to work. In short order, he learned that the remaining followers of the Sheikh, as the FBI tracked the bombers down around the world, working with New York City detectives who found one in Egypt, uh, who found another um, later in Pakistan, who tracked their master bomb maker, Ramzi Yosef, uh, literally around the world till they caught him in a guest house one day outside of uh, Karachi. The terrorist task force um, sent Salem back to work and he found out that the new plan among the Sheikh's followers, who included most uh, of the people that they had started to see in the plot to get the commando training, well, it turns out that my guess was wrong. The commando training didn't seem to be for a jailbreak. When they got the diagrams and they looked at the street names, um, and, and, and it was 6th Avenue in the 50s, and they figured out what the pictures were of, it was to have an assault and assassination of Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak during his visit to New York while he was at the Hilton Hotel on Avenue of the Americas. They warned Mubarak not to come because they, they couldn't stop the plot in time, or at least be sure that they would. They canceled that trip. Um, the rest of the plan was to blow up the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel, the George Washington Bridge, the United Nations, and this part they actually took a little personally, the FBI building. <laughs> they rented them a safe house. Imad Salem, the informant who was the fired informant who was now rehired, um, had convinced them that he was an expert bomb maker. Tommy Corrigan from the Terrorist Task Force um, tells us in the book The Cell, I'm not, I'm not sure Imad Salem could have brewed a cup of coffee, but he played a pretty good bomb maker. So he has them in there stirring the chemicals to make these bombs to blow up the bridges and tunnels. The FBI, of course, has rented the safe house for them and has supplied it with video and audio coverage so they can actually watch this witch's brew being cooked up. And just before the plot was to take off, um, the bombers started to go to other sources looking for equipment and detonators, and somebody wisely figured out, well, <laughs> we know the parts we gave them won't work, but what if they get some parts that do? So they raided their own safe house and arrested everybody in a dramatic takedown that really forestalled the all-out attack on New York City. Now, 
The embassy, I mean, the, uh, the World Trade Center bombers uh, went to trial. They were all convicted. They all received sentences uh, in the telephone number digits. Most of them received life. Uh, the plotters, including the blind sheikh, who allegedly inspired them, uh, received similar sentences in the plot to blow up New York. And through all the evidence in those cases, they began to find a name that kept coming up, first just a little bit, and then more often. The name was Osama bin Laden. It turns out that Osama bin Laden was the man who was paying for the monthly expenses of the blind sheikh to stay here in America. It turns out that Osama bin Laden was the man who funded the um, Afghan services office, which was downstairs in the same mosque on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. It turns out that the Afghan services office was connected to an outfit called the services offices in uh, Peshawar, Pakistan, which later uh, morphed into an organization that changed its name to Al-Qaeda. In slow motion, the Joint Terrorist Task Force and, and the small group of us that covered organized terrorism in America were watching Al-Qaeda be born, although most of us didn't know it at that time. But as bin Laden's name kept creeping up after the trial involving the attempt to blow up the landmarks, the FBI jo Joint Terrorist Task Force agents went down to the CIA and they said, we have a little evidence here. And you probably have a lot of information. Do you mind if we flip through your files? And the CIA really didn't do much business with the FBI and terrorism back then. But this was opening a new door. It was a test of a new relationship. And they said, sure, take a look at these files. And they found out that the CIA had volumes of intelligence on bin Laden, on his activities and his bases in the Sudan, of the things he did um, in Afghanistan during the war against the Russians. And some of this information started to connect with information they had. Out of all the names, they picked one particular fellow, and they said, this guy was bin Laden's right-hand man, his personal secretary, his aide-de-camp. And if we were going to capture anybody and flip them, who could kind of open the doors for us to this organization, Al-Qaeda, it might be this guy. His name was Wadi al Haj. He had been transferred from bin Laden's headquarters to an outpost in Nairobi, Kenya where he was running um, a front, an al-Qaeda front, which uh, masqueraded as a charity service for refugees. So with the Kenyan police, uh, the CIA, and one FBI agent raided al Haj's house, and they took his laptop, and they found, found a long memo about um, the East African cell, about how the engineers, I think you can read that as a code name for bombers, uh, were worried that... Uh, they would be stopped before uh, they followed their leader's orders. It essentially was a couple of pages that was in, in fairly plain language saying that there were plots in East Africa by these cells, that they were working for bin Laden, and that they were worried that the FBI, the CIA, and the Kenyans were on to them. And, of course, they were right. Wadi al Haj was convinced that it was no longer safe for him there. He came back to the United States and settled in Texas got himself a job in a tire store, was called to the grand jury to testify, said he didn't really know bin Laden, didn't really know any of these other guys, didn't have any knowledge about terrorism. And the feeling was that whatever that cell had been up to, they had certainly disrupted it by taking out their leader and pretty much transmitting to them that we were on to you. Now at this particular moment, something interesting happens. We're trying to find bin Laden because I know he's now the focus of this investigation. And after months of asking, he suddenly says, yes, he'll see us. Uh, myself and a small team from ABC News go there. We interview him. In probably the strangest interview I've ever conducted in my career, they said he will answer any of your questions, which I thought was great and very open and kind of democratic way of having a discourse. Uh, they said, but we will not translate his answers. <laughs> and I said, well... That won't really work because then it's going to be very difficult to have the follow-up questions. And they said, that will be no problem. There will be no follow-up questions. <laughs> now I was beginning to realize there was a level of media sophistication here. We hadn't been driven around in the back of a blacked-out truck for two days for nothing. So during the interview, I asked my 20 questions, which I would read from my paper, and then the translator would repeat. And bin Laden had a habit of looking at the translator because he knew I had no idea what he was saying. Um, but I had a habit of looking back at him and nodding as if suddenly, miraculously, I had understood Arabic perfectly. <laughs> that was just to address a television problem, which is I couldn't have a, an hour-long interview with a guy looking over here. 
I needed him to be focused in the direction of the camera so he'd be speaking to the audience. Um, in the end, I went to my translator, who was kept way in the back, and I said, did he actually answer any of these questions? And he said, oh, boss, we have very big story. I said, what's the story? He said he declared war on America. He said he would send Americans back home in coffins and in boxes and that the war would start very soon. I said, when he was saying this, what was I doing? He said, you were nodding in agreement the whole time. <laughs> it wasn't your normal interview. Um, and of course, we came back and broadcast that to the world on World News Tonight with Peter Jennings on Nightline for a full half hour with uh, a military and national security analysis by my colleague John McQuethy. And essentially America, A, had met a new character, and B, had been put on notice um, that he might be very dangerous to this country. And America's reaction was a logical one, which was to lock down all of its embassies and bases in Saudi Arabia, where bin Laden was from, in and around other Middle East countries where they felt vulnerable. But then the East African cell, which they thought they had disrupted, came back together um, with Wadi El Hajj's deputy, who simply took over operations. And simultaneously, in August of 1998, six and a half weeks after my meeting with bin Laden, blew up two United States embassies, killing 224 people, among them 12 Americans. At this point, it was clear that bin Laden had declared war on America in earnest. It was not clear necessarily that America was willing to declare war back. 75 cruise missiles worth $1 million apiece were sent towards bin Laden's three camps, one of which we had this meeting in, um, fairly well destroying them. And based on the intelligence that bin Laden and his commanders would be meeting there, that intelligence turned out to be a little off the mark in terms of timing. None of bin Laden or his top aides were injured. But bin Laden said in a communication to us at ABC through our man in Peshawar the next day that he was alive and well and that the war had just begun. The big debate that I think that has gone on in the discourse before September 11th, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on September 11th because there's not a lot that we could talk about that you all haven't read or heard somewhere else. Um, there are some of the intimate secrets of the cell that you can read in this book. But as far as the history of it, I think we know that because it's much fresher than the stuff I'm talking about now. But um, in the wake of that, that's where Michael Stone and I um, and Chris Mitchell, who put this book together, tried to stand back and do a little analysis. Meaning, well, why didn't America declare war back? And the answers and theories are several fold. One is that President Clinton was deeply immersed in the Monica Lewinsky scandal, which had to be terribly distracting to day-to-day -day operations. Um, the, day that, uh, the day that the missile launch happened was the day that she was testifying in the grand jury. It's not to say that he wasn't focused on the response, but it was hard to put your total focus on any one issue when your presidency was in, in, jeopard in jeopardy. Um, I think another issue is Sandy Berger told uh, Michael and I in a meeting, who was the president's national security advisor, yeah, it sounds like a great idea now after September 11th, after 2,800 uh, plus homicides, after the largest terrorist attack in the history of the world. But show me one commentator, show me one congressman, show me one senator, show me one reporter who would have said after 12 Americans were killed in the embassy bombings that we should have risk thousands of Americans li lives and inv invaded Afghanistan. Think of that in the context of the post-Vietnam American thinking about wars and invasions in far off places. Who would have, who would have, what poll would have told us that we should have done that? Um, I don't know who did a poll, so I don't know if he's right, but it's food for thought. And then of course comes September 11th, um, the history of which I don't have to get into. But I wanted to give you a taste um, not of the intimate detective story that the book is, because when you read the book, what you'll do is you'll follow detectives like Tommy Corrigan, who are involved in the commando training plot. You'll meet detectives like Louis Napoli, who's told to fire his key informant in the bombing plot. You will trail them as they conduct the most intimate surveillances of picking up subjects whose name they don't even know because they turn up in a surveillance of a suspected terrorist location and they trail him and he ends up meeting somebody and then back at the air at the office of the task force they compare photographs and find out that that guy's in a picture that they took 
three years ago of a group they suspected that was involved in target practice and how they put together who they are and how they uncovered all these plots. Because an awful lot of focus, and I have to admit a lot of the focus of this book is what went wrong, what they missed. How did they let two of the September 11th hijackers into this country, free and clear through immigration and customs, 17 months after the CIA could have put them on a terrorist watch list because they recorded them in a secret Al-Qaeda meeting in Malaysia? It raises all those questions. It attempts to answer some of them. But it also concentrates on some of the great successes. The incredible detective work and street savviness of the New York detectives on the terrorist task force and their FBI partners the plots that were prevented, um, like the, uh, the bombings of the tunnels and the, the, assassination of, the attempted assassination of Mubarak. So it's, it's, a, it's a book that we had to talk about a lot because I said to Michael, uh, you know these guys, I know these guys, a lot of these guys are our friends. And early on, we decided they had done a lot of good work, um, there had been some missteps, and we would just tell the story flat out. Um, I'd like to start taking your questions about, um, about the story and anything else you wanted to ask about uh, right about now. Yes. Yes, I have three questions. First of all, um, uh, about, since I haven't read your book, about Salem's um, loyalties back and forth. Second, um, what light you shed on the Sudan offer early for bin Laden, and then perhaps something about the bombing of the coal. In order. The trouble with Salem and the FBI brass, even though his agent handlers had faith in him, was that they were suspicious that because he wouldn't wear a tape recorder, maybe his targets really weren't saying what he claimed they were. They say he would go to meetings and he would go in and he would come out and he would leave and that they would watch the building and the people he said he met with wouldn't come out. They had started to doubt him, um, which is why they eventually let him go. It was just terrible that the proof that made him take him back was such a catas catastrophic event, or that they didn't really go with the instincts of the agents who would have continued him because they knew he may not have been the easiest informant to work with, but at the time he was their only source of information. The offer from the Sudan um, that our questioner refers to is, at one point, when bin Laden's bases were in Sudan, the government of Sudan came to the United States and uh, to shortcut it, they said, we don't want to be a terrorist nation that's on the outs with everybody and that's the list you've got us on what do we have to do to get off the list and the United States gave them a short list and one of the things was tell us all about this guy bin Laden and hand him over to somebody and the Sudanese um, approached a couple of countries who were friendly to us who said eh, we don't really want him and the Sudanese said well we'll give him to you so the United States um, State Department and CIA called the, the Justice Department and they said if they give us this guy bin Laden do we have enough to charge him with something, to bring him to trial? And they said, well, we're working on something, but no, not yet. So essentially they came to the Sudanese and said, he's organized and he's operating in your place. We can't take him because we don't know how. We're a nation of laws, we have a constitution, we can't just pick up some guy from a foreign country and keep him because we feel like it, because we don't like him, and we don't have the evidence sufficient to sustain a conviction in court yet, we may someday. So at least get him out of the Sudan, where he's got his infrastructure. And of course, they sent him to the one place where we could never exercise any control of him, Afghanistan. Last part of your question. See, I thought I wasn't paying attention. I remembered all this. <laughs> the bombing of the coal. As much as I believe, and there's still debate on this, that's my opinion, not as a reporter, because that's where I deal in facts, but just as an analyst, <clears throat> as much as I believe the Lewinsky matter distracted the Clinton administration from putting its full interest in starting the war on terrorism. The coal came at another difficult political juncture. Remember, bin Laden had declared war in this country. It was almost like he couldn't get us to declare war back. He had bombed two of our embassies, he had killed a dozen of our people, and a couple of hundred more, many of them Muslims, which was, you know, just a, an added part of the tragedy. And now he had attacked a warship using a rowboat and almost taken a billion dollar piece of America's most serious arsenal and sunk it in Aden Harbor in Yemen. At that time, President Clinton was desperately fighting for a Mideast peace accord. One, 
probably, because it was just the very right thing to do. It still is. Two, probably, uh, because as a president whose legacy had been so damaged by being impeached, by being immersed in a sex scandal, by, by having his other accomplishments um, so distracted by the blinding light of that story, that um, I think he was trying to, in a desperate battle against the clock, to make his legacy something other than that. Not the president who was caught in the sex scandal, the president who left with a Mideast peace deal that stuck. Now these guys blow up the USS Cole. There's 17 U.S. service men and women who are dead. There's 40 some odd injured. A billion dollar battleship is about to sink in Aden Harbor. And at this most critical juncture where they are reaching out for King Hussein of Jordan to come in and try and push the parties into a deal that they're reluctant to make was not the time that the administration probably felt it was politically advantageous to send 74 more cruise missiles towards bin Laden's bases in Afghanistan, an Islamic country. So the crime of the USS Cole, even unlike the embassy bombings, you know, where there was some answer, essentially went unanswered by the United States. Now, to be fair, the Clinton administration said, we went to the Justice Department and the CIA every day and said, do you have the kind of proof that will justify us doing something like that against bin Laden? And every day they told us no. Um, I think that that's why they were still operating in a different mindset than we operate in today. Back then we considered everything based on the parameters we understand as a country for evidence that could be used in court. Will it rise beyond a reasonable doubt? Now we're much more in a wartime footing, which is if we think it's more likely than not, the country seems to be willing to take action abroad. I hope that answered those. Yes, sir. You made a very profound uh, comment uh, on uh, one of the t television programs uh, last Sunday. You said that uh, the moment you heard about the attack on the World Trade Center that you knew it was bin Laden. And um, I'm sure that uh, I, I came to the conclusion that uh, as soon as the attack occurred uh, our government came out and said it was bin Laden also so they came to the same conclusion and the con conclusion that I drew at that point in time was that they obviously knew about it or knew something was coming and personally I find that very disturbing and do you think the rest of American the rest of the world realizes uh, how disturbing that is? I think that the American government did realize something was coming. I base that on my discussions leading up to September 11th with everybody um, in the intelligence business and the counterterrorism business that I was talking to said, you know, we can hear the beat of the drums. Something is coming. And they were trying like hell to stop it. They broke up the Al-Qaeda cell in Frankfurt. They broke up, that led them to break up the Al-Qaeda cell in Milan. Clues found there and in Frankfurt led them to identify and break up the Al-Qaeda cell in London. And I said, um, near the end of August, standing in my backyard at a barbecue, to um, one of my good friends and invited guests, John O'Neill, who was head of the National Security Division in the FBI's New York office and the head of the FBI's effort against bin Laden from the Joint Terrorist Task Force on down. I said, you guys are doing great. Uh, you got the cells in Europe. Uh, you foiled a bunch of plots, probably one probably involving nerve gas, the others involving bombings and attacks. You know, since, since the embassy bombing, since you've really put the focus on that with our worldwide partners, they can't seem to get an attack off. They caught Rassam at the border who wanted to blow up Los Angeles airport on New Year's Day. Uh, the day before that, there was to be an attack in Jordan targeting Westerners. The Jordan in, uh, intelligence folded that up. At the same time, the precursor to the coal bombing, uh, the attempt to bomb the USS Sullivan's was underway. And, you know, through, through our luck and their failing, the terrorists took their bomb, loaded to the hilt uh, in, a, in a boat. The boat had the explosives loaded in its lining where um, styrofoam and other things that would have kept it afloat were, and they put it in the water and it sank like a rock. They had to take that back to the drawing board. So, yeah. The people who studied this on a daily basis knew something was happening. And I said to O'Neill, 
they can't, they can't get one off. You're just all over them. And he said, yeah, we're all over them. We got those cells. But we don't know about the one we don't know about. And they didn't know that the one they didn't know about was the one in Frankfurt. Now, there were some missed signals there, which are detailed in the book, which, in hindsight, are pretty appalling. When you listen to them explain how they could have been missed, why they were missed, some of the answers make sense, some more than others. But um, it, it wasn't for the lack of trying. Um, but I think they certainly knew that, that the game was afoot and bin Laden was getting more frustrated by each time an attack was prevented. Um, let's try somebody right back there. Yep. Um, I, w I was wondering, uh, some, some of the facts about the terrorists and their actions seem to, seem to show them in the light of being bumbling, bumbling, you know, bumbling fools. Like, uh, like the, when, when the Kahani assassin tr is supposed to meet his cab driver and they're not there. Or in the 93 bombing, when the guy goes to return the van to the rental agency. And, and then there are other, other facts that are coming out about the terrorists seem to paint them as very, very sophisticated. Like they, the, when the terrorist attack first, after September 11th, there, was the, there were word sleepers. We heard about we heard about uh, terrorists that were that that seemed to live among us for many many years. You know, very disciplined, very sophisticated. And I, I was just wondering, do you see them as um, you know just bumbling idiots that get lucky, or or are they are they really are they really very sophisticated, very smart terrorists? I I think you answered your own question. I mean, when you look back at Mohammed Salome, who goes back to the rental agency where he rented the bomb that carried the truck to the World Trade Center, and he tries to get his four hundred dollar deposit back, <laughs> um, on the list of you know maybe things you'd put don't next to in your next terrorist plot, that's probably high. I doubt in any truck bombing they have ever gone back for a deposit since. On the other hand, um, you take a look at the 9-11 plot in stark contrast. Um, look what they did. They committed the largest act of terrorism in world history. They murdered almost 3,000 people in cold blood in coordinated actions on a single day in a single country against the targets that would most symbolize America's physical might, the Pentagon, its economic uh, prowess through the world, the World Trade Center symbolizing business and finance and commerce. In doing so, they shocked the sensibilities of Americans, made them afraid in their own country, made them doubt the power of their own government, injured their economy, caused stock prices to fall. And what did they do this with? They didn't have a nuclear weapon although they were working on it. They didn't use chemical or biological weapons made in a sophisticated lab, although they had one near the Kandahar airport. They didn't use a terribly sophisticated plan by hijacking an F-15 from some friendly nation's air force. They did this through meticulous thought and planning by using box cutters and plane tickets. And that is a formidable enemy, um, which shows formidable thinking. And that's what we're in danger of now, because every time we have an attack, whether it's a truck bombing or an airplane hijacking or using planes as missiles, we approach that target. We put walls around our embassies, harden the target. No truck can get through. We increase airport security threefold and then tenfold. It'd be very difficult to hijack a plane these days. First of all, security should catch you, but we know it's imperfect. Now what we know is the passengers will beat the heck out of you. <laughs> There's no more of that docile stuff going on. That went out before, after September 11th. Now if you get up to go to the men's room on one of these flights, four people attack you right in the aisle. <laughs> it's a whole different place now. But I mean, you have to look at, um, that's the type of opponent we're dealing with. They're well financed. It was probably a plot that cost about a million dollars, or maybe half that on a shoestring. Uh, but they still had the financing, and they did the planning. Um, that person in the back with the glasses. Um, I, uh, my heart is breaking because if you knew John O'Neill, why wouldn't you connect that there was some kind of impropriety that an FBI counterintelligence 
superior would be in the World Trade Center. Why shouldn't there be term limits like you cannot get a civil job after, after, in a certain time span? And what about all those breaches that Andrea Mitchell confessed to? And why were all the doors of the World Trade Center stairwells locked? This was a conspiracy led by Dick Cheney, Mr. And you better get all of the whole story so that you have a better picture of what's really going on. It's the foreign policy. Mr. Clark has the International Action Center. He can fill you in on, on why this is happening to America. If that was a question, <laughs> and, I, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to treat it lightly. I know, I know some people laugh. Um, I'll, I'll take a, a run at answering it. Um, the doors in the stairwell of the World Trade Center weren't locked, although the doors leading to the roof were. They were locked, um, probably growing out of a dispute from the last World Trade Center bombing, um, where the police department wanted to land their helicopter on the roof to make rescues, and the fire department objected to that practice. And um, in some conference with the Port Authority, they had decided to lock those doors by computer. There was a control center that could remotely unlock them. But by the time the fire had burned out most of the wires, um, that control center wasn't going to be reaching anything that answered to electricity on the roof of those buildings. As far as John O'Neill, um, and you, you know, we touch a bit of a nerve here. He was one of the key intelligence officials of the FBI who, in his own frustration um, with what was happening with the Bureau um, and some of the things that were going on in his career, um, quit the FBI a couple of weeks after we had that conversation in my backyard and accepted a new position that he was very happy about. Um, he was excited to finally be going into the private sector where for the first time in his life as a career civil servant he'd be earning um, the kind of money that an executive who didn't work in government would get. Um, he was appointed director of security for the World Trade Center and ended up uh, dying on his second day at work. Um, as far as the rest of those conspiracies, um, I'm just a New York crime reporter, and I think um, what Mr. Cheney had to do with all that is a little beyond me tonight. Um, but it's nothing that I wouldn't look into. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I know you had your hand up before. I'm trying to catch up. Um, my question is about religion. Well, you have to start over again. He just yeah, caught I'm up. I'm sorry. Uh, my question is about religion. Um, when you listen to Bin Laden, every second word is punctuated by Allah knows and Allah knew and Allah will know. Sure. And uh, it's like a valley girl with okay. It's uh, one way of looking at it. Probably not his view, but I get the analogy. Okay. Um, my question is, you know, we've talked so much, and you hardly hear anything about religion, really. I mean, do these guys really believe that they're saving the world for of, Islam? Of course they or do. Or have they sort of run with the ball and gotten out of the field? Of course somehow? they have. you got to remember that, um, and this is not a new thought, that all the biggest killing in the history of time was done in the name of God. Um... You can, and you can argue either side of this issue, but those who are pro-life, you know, in the abortion debate, uh, have no compunction about killing doctors in the name of God because they have an opinion in that direction. Um, those who, um, you know, fight holy wars through the ages. So mass murder in the name of God is not a new theory, and justifying it as such is um, not something that hasn't happened before. And cleansing one's soul uh, for one's political beliefs by saying that I'm doing something that's almost unthinkable, by saying, but it's okay, I'm doing it in the name of God is an age-old bad habit we've had as a civilization, if you can call people who do things like that that. Um, in the white dress in the back. Can I just sure. Say one more thing? Actually, my question was, my question was, has it <laughs> Has it gotten out of, in other words, it started in the name of God. But most crusades, you know, start in the name of God and sort of end with that. But has this gone beyond? Have they sort of become like a bunch of wild yahoos, you know, one I, wild I, and forgotten I think, about God along the way? I mean, I, I can't say I spent a lot of time with Bin Laden. I spent an hour with him on a mountaintop. Um, but if you want to go by a vibe I get from a man, 
Um, I think that he believed he was doing this in the name of his God, in the name of his interpretation of that religion. And anybody knows that, you know, there's three places you can go and look in a book and find a page that says it's okay to kill, a page that said it's not okay to kill. One is the Bible, the other is the Koran, and the only other kind of books that can tell you it's okay and not okay to do the same thing in the same volume is a law book. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not hard to figure out that people seek out the interpretations that they believe in. Okay. Ms. Donlin runs yes. a tight ship here. I'm going to let you pick the last question, so this isn't on me. Gentleman over there with the purple shirt over his. Okay. Very much. It's sort of a two part question. Is Nasser still in jail? And if he's not, where is he? And the other thing is. Let me answer uh, the first one fast. Yeah. And he ain't going nowhere. Okay, he the was, other. He was sentenced to 20 years on the Kahani business and then life on the conspiracy to blow up the rest of it. Okay. Uh, do you think it's possible that when they would try to attack next something, that uh, they would try to, um, how can I say it, uh, use people that would be less uh, suspected. For example, when, uh, when Israelis were uh, killed in uh, Cyprus, uh, instead of Muslims, they sent members of the IRA who sort of exchanged tasks with each other. Would something like that, would, they, would the government be thinking about something like that as being possible? I, would, them? I would give you um, Mr. John Walker Lind. That's one example, um, and I, I'm going to digress for just 10 seconds to say there was a lot of discussion in the CIA about how difficult it would be to penetrate al-Qaeda and that it was um, something that they had tried to do and found a tremendous challenge. John Walker Lynn seemed to just walk in the front door and said, hey, what are you guys doing? Let me do it with you. Um, that raises a lot of questions about how much we were trying. And um, the second name is Mr. Padilla who was um, an American um, of the Islamic faith who became radicalized and, and sought them out and was put to work on what's purported to be a plan to set off a dirty bomb within the United States. And that information was developed partly in the camps down in Guantanamo by questioning suspects there, partly by a very smart um, CIA operative and a State Department investigator in the Middle East who put two and two together, and partly by Abu Zubayda, um, Al-Qaeda's chief recruiter, who was in custody, who was shown a picture and said, yeah, that's the guy. So that's how those things come together. But if your question is, were they thinking, find people with Western identities, American passports, and try to put them to work for evil? The answer was, yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you um, for being there. I think Ms. Donlan has to tell you something else right after this. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for letting me go on and on. Um, I urge you to read the book because now that you heard what I sound like, Michael Stone wrote most of it, so the rest of it just goes much better than listening to me. Um, and he's my co-author and did a tremendous job along with Chris Mitchell, who um, really did a pretty intimate job of tracking the hijackers' movements leading up to September 11th. But really, don't let the book scare you. It doesn't sound like this speech. It's a very good detective story, and there's a lot of information in there that... Um, I think we all need to know, especially now. Thanks very, very much. Thank you, John. And he's right. It is a wonderful book and a good detective story. Um, to make things easier on all of us, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask if anybody is not staying for the book signing that they leave now. and. I'm going to ask that everybody come up, form a line to my right, and when you leave, perhaps you could come up row by row to make it easier, and when you leave, leave to my far right, or the middle, please. Can I go all right? Oh, thanks. Thank and there, Michael Stone was hiding in the corner. I was there. Yeah. Okay, you just stand back over here. Until we get, everybody's going to just stand back. I'm a reporter. I know that. So, how are you? That's right. You got a haircut. I don't want anybody walking up. And a haircut. We have a publicist here for John or anybody from PR? Okay. You want to speak to this gentleman? He's with the press. He wants to have a discussion with John here. Thank you. Okay. Regulate him in one at a time. 
just write that. Yeah. I said it all right that Well, we shouldn't do that here. We should call me and we should get together. John Miller is co-host of ABC's 2020 and co-author of The Cell, Inside the 9-11 Plot, and Why the FBI and CIA Failed to Stop It. It's published by Hyperion, online at hyperionbooks.com.